Hello everyone and welcome to your Glasto video report for week 38, 2023. So what we're looking at today is kind of a carry on from what we looked, talked about in probably the last three weeks where we've seen this net shift towards capital outflows. And this is whether we look at it from the perspective of uh, the realized cap change in BTC and ETH, the two major assets, or if we see it in stablecoin outflows. So overall, we've seen this kind of net capital outflow. We've seen that the market has kind of stagnated below this 30,000 level, trying to get above that cycle midpoint. And what we're starting to see is how that's playing out in investor confidence. And what we covered at the end of last week was that it is primarily the short-term holders who are our cohort of interest. The long-term holders are pretty much doing absolutely nothing, which is very typical for this phase in the cycle. So what we're going to do is really dive in and spend a lot of time looking at these short-term holders and really going a bit finer into how we can really analyze this cohort. So what we're going to do today is really work our way up to introducing a new metric, which we're going to call the confidence in trend indicator. And really what we're looking for here, but we'll build up to it step by step, but really we're looking for when do the spenders in the short-term holder cost uh, in the short-term holder cohort, the people who are actually spending when do they have a lower cost basis than the ones who are holding? So the other way to think about this, your short-term holder cohort is a big blob of people who've acquired their coins in the last five months. Now, some of those people will have a, a cost basis above the current price. Some will be a little bit below it. There's a bit of a spread about where those folks are. And what we're really going to build it up to is looking for when do we see the spenders panicking more than the people who are holding onto their supply. So when does that that kind of big group of short-term holders, when do they transition from panicking, from taking profits at the top, to actually panicking, starting to sell at a loss as the market starts to trade lower? So we're going to build up to this using a bunch of different metrics, but all of these are going to be focused really on the short-term holder cohort. So as always, please do give us a rate, a share, and a subscribe. It does help this channel get to more people. As always, let me know if you have any questions or comments. And without further ado, let's get stuck right into the analysis. So what we're going to start with is really setting the scene. Where do we currently sit in 2023 as we come into the, you know, almost coming up to the fourth quarter of the year? Where do we sit? And what does the, the kind of overall performance of the market look like today? So the first chart we're going to look at uses two different pricing models. We have our investor price in the green, and we have our delta price here in the purple. Now, just to give you a bit of a character or a flavor of these, the investor price is essentially the realized price, but subtracting all of the primary mining. We don't care about the thermo cap, the component where mine is actually the first mine supply. We're going to ignore that. We're only considering coins that have moved in secondary markets, which is why it's called the investor cap or the investor price. Now, the delta price is essentially a combined on-chain. It's the realized price subtracting the all-time average price. So there's a little bit of on-chain and a little bit of technical. Um, now, the reason why we do this is that at some point in time, such as bull markets, you can see that these actually compress together. This orange curve here is literally mapping out how compressed those two models are. At bull market peaks, there's so much spending and there's so much profit taking that the investor cap and the realized cap collapse to be very, very close to each other, a very, very low degree of compression. Now, during a bear market, the losses start to get locked in, some of those last ditch profits start to get locked in, and the realized cap, or the investor cap in this case, tends to trade relatively sideways and plateau. Not much really happens for generally years at a time. You can see here in 20, uh, 2021 onwards, we're essentially trading at about the same level we have for, well, since uh, this time, or May 2021. Now, in that time, price obviously falls down quite significantly. The 2018 bear market was brutal. The 2022 bear market was brutal. So what's happening there is that the average price, the technical side of that equation, the delta cap, starts to expand. So we get this expansion because the, the technical bearishness of price action starts to over, overwhelm or overcome and cause this divergence. The overall behavior of the technical side of the equation takes control and it generally peaks. This compression starts to widen at its largest when we get to the bottom of these bear cycles. It's basically saying that the technicals are so dire and yet investors have essentially stopped realizing any major profits, losses. We're starting to get to that buyer seller exhaustion period where the market's looking like it wants to go into some kind of an inflection point. 
Now you'll note here, really the key side, we've had this kind of pullback from this level of compression. It's starting to really trade sideways across this level. And this is what we call the decompression phase in our newsletter. You can see that all of 2019 was this sideways decompression phase. And we only really get this squeezing back together as the bull market kicks in. 2016 was this long, slow grinding decompression phase. And it was only in 2017 that we got a major acceleration. These two started to close back in together. So in many ways, we have many of the same patterns and similarities. It very much looks like that 2019 style market where we've had the initial recovery. And now we're in that grinding, slow kind of reaccumulation. The market's still digesting all of the chaos of both the upside and the downside uh, that 2021 and 2022 were. Now, to put this into another layer of perspective, um, this is just such an amazing metric. This is the R hodl ratio, um, originally developed by Philip Swift. Um, this is one of my favorite on-chain metrics just because of how elegant it is and how reliable this particular indicator has been. Um, very, very simply, high values means that a very large proportion of the supply is held by hot supply. Lots of the wealth invested in Bitcoin is held in recently moved coins. Low values are the exact opposite, where we're looking at all of the supply held. There's a large clustering or most of the supplies held by those longer term holders. Coins that are one to two years. Now, I've tried many different variations of one month and, you know, greater than three years and all sorts of different boundaries. For whatever reason, um, this particular original r hodl ratio just seems to be that really nice balance of the one weeks and the one to two years just seems to work really, really nicely. Now, what we've visualized here is we've put a two-year moving median on it, really. And what we're looking for here is inflection points. Now, we can see here that as we came out of the 2016, kind of that bare floor here in 2015, we crossed over the one, the, the sorry, the two-year median. It had essentially corrected down during the bear, and it signified that we were starting to move back into a wealth transfer event. The older money from back here in the previous cycle slowly but surely started transferring their coins to new buyers. Now, bear in mind, this is on log scale. So it starts very slow, even though it looks like a linear curve. It starts slow, but it goes parabolic into the tops. We had the same event as we came right before March 2020. This was this kind of uncertainty period where it was very much hodler dominated. There was no reinforcements, very few capital coming in. In, in many ways, the 2019 era was very similar to 20, uh, 2015. There just was only the hardcore hodlers that remained. And in many ways, we're in a very, very similar pattern. So we only crossed this two-year median right before March 2020. And really, March 2020 was kind of that final event that just created that parabolic move to the upside. And where we are at the moment, we are more or less contesting with a very, very similar decompression in between sideways, not really much going on type phase of the market. So you can see there's a couple of these different indicators, both the wealth of coins, where we are in terms of these pricing models that have very, very similar characteristics. Now, this is a model we haven't looked at in some time. This is the uh, accumulation trend score. And just as a quick reminder of how this works, what we're looking at is over the last 30 days, on chain, we're looking at all the different wallets, we're excluding exchanges and miners. And we're basically just looking at say over the last 30 days, have entities generally speaking, increased or decreased their holdings. If entities aren't doing anything, they won't show up. If they are distributing coins, and that's, you know, the, the exchange is kind of this middle ground area where coins go in and then out to somebody else. Purple zones means there was lots of balance growth. Lots and lots of entities are increasing their holdings. Yellow colors are showing the opposite, that there's actually a net distribution pressure that's going on. And obviously it grades between the two. Now, for our particular purposes, it's kind of two, we're going to focus on the purple zones. There's two areas that really stand out. There's bottoms, where people really step in and actually buy this thing. March 2020, it was over. FTX, it was over. When Three Arrows blew up, it was over. And yet people still stepped in and actually acquired coins on those dips. These are the kind of things that set market floors. Now, the other time is that people buy the rip. Right, this is looking like a FOMO rally. People are buying at the top here thinking we're going to 150K and instead we went to 15, right? So these are people who are buying at the peak. 2019 is probably the most relevant to our current scenario. People tend to buy at the tops, the local tops. And as you can see on both of our attempts to get above 31,000, we had a period of large accumulation. This is this, even though we know it's just the hodlers that are left over, 
that cohort still experiences degrees of FOMO. And we can really see this playing out. Interestingly, people distribute towards the lows and we get this kind of regime shift over time. Sometimes they're willing to step in and actually buy the lows and put those flaws in. Sometimes we move more into this excitement phase where people get a little bit greedy and they overextend themselves as the market moves too far um, uh, to the upside. But a lot of these mechanics this is kind of the framework. We're now going to explore this in a lot more detail um, and particularly focus on the realized profit and loss spectrum, which if you spend any time studying this channel, um, we spend a lot of time looking at realized profit and loss because it really is. At the end of the day, profit and loss is what drives markets. It's what drives investor decisions. And all of these supply changes are being driven by that, you know, that, that factor of greed under the surface. So to really illustrate this, what we've got here is the seven day sum of realized profit in green and realized loss in red. We've got the net um, taking the, the difference between the two. Notice how people tend to capitulate maximum losses at the bottoms. Notice how people tend to take maximum profits near the tops. These are the contrarian signals. Quite often we find that realized profit and loss indicators are in that contrarian signal. You're looking for when lots and lots of people are capitulating, typically happens around the lows. When lots of people are taking profits, it's probably getting a little bit frothy and things are getting a little bit overheated. Um, if we look at the 2019 market, note that on both of these rallies, these kind of local peaks got put in on maximum profit. So what we're looking for is those contrarian signals. When lots of profits are being taken, it generally happens in a bull market or an uptrend, which is a good sign. But simultaneously, that profit taking is ultimately what puts the top in because it eventually overwhelms demand. So it's looking for this fine balance between when the realized profit, which is good because it happens in a bull market, but it also happens to put the top in. Likewise for realized losses. When everybody is capitulating at the absolute lows, it generally signals that you're reaching a point of seller exhaustion because they had, in 2022, they had the whole leg from zero to 75% down to sell. And isn't it funny that they all seem to sell at the 75% mark at the same time? It's these major capitulation events where the, the, the investing herd tends to behave in a very, very similar way. Um, and really, this is kind of the crux of what we look at on-chain um, with the, the realized profit and loss and on-chain analysis. This is where a lot of the edge is because we're really trying to understand that psychological game of profit and loss, which drives markets, coupled with that market psychology and the herd behavior where people all tend to do the exact same thing at the exact same time. And quite often that's the wrong thing to do. So really looking at these things in perspective. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we've focused on the short term holders. And this is where we're going to really start drilling down and focusing on this group. Um, last week, what we left you with is a view, and you can see here, this um, blue oscillator is the percent of short-term holders in profit of their supply. Now you can see that they, everyone was happy at the exact same time where those profits were being taken, we saw before, we'll dive into that a bit more in a second. You can see that at these peaks, every single short-term holder was in profit, happy days. Now, almost all of them, certainly on this dip down to, to lower levels, almost 100% of them got down to in loss. So there's a lot of short-term holders who have a cost basis and are, let's just use, um, for, for want of a better term, trapped in this current price range between about 31 and 26. That zone, we've got the large majority of short-term holders. And this makes us a bit price sensitive. You can see that this is actually the first time that we had a complete washout of all of these short-term holders in loss since FTX blew up. Now we can also see that typically speaking, when these happen, it tends to also correlate with those capitulation style events. So let's just bring our thesis together here. The short-term holders typically drive that short-term price action. Typically, the long-term holders are much more active at cycle tops and bottoms. They're generally quiet in between. They're kind of that quiet base load accumulation and then panic distribution, profit taking at the extremes. The short-term holders, on the other hand, they really are this hot ball of money that follows the price. They're the ones making decisions and they're the ones that are most sensitive to their cost basis. When they all go into profit, it often correlates with, I mean, naturally, when all the recent buyers are in profit, it's going to create an incentive to put a top in, to start taking profits and selling. Likewise, when everybody who recently bought and is really price sensitive sees all their coins go into a loss, lots of them actually do panic 
they transfer their coins to new buyers, you get a changing of hands, and that is often happening near cycle lows or local lows. So you can see here, we're trying to move away from just cyclical tops and bottoms and actually looking at what's going on in the shorter term microstructure. You're looking at when these short term holders are really likely to be driving this price action. So I've got two different concepts there. Again, we're just focusing on short term holders, but there's two indicators, and these are actually almost like I mean, they're, they're, they're siblings. We've got the classic MVRV, right? Market value to realize value. This indicator is showing you the unrealized profit or loss held by this cohort. It has a similar metric called SOPA, which is the spent or the realized profit or loss. So both of these indicators are showing you a dimensionless parameter. It's basically the average profit or loss held by short-term holders or the average profit and loss locked in by short-term holders. This is a really, really important concept is we have the unspent domain, the supply domain, the unrealized, the MVRV, and we have the volume, the spending, the realized profit and loss, and SOPA. They are describing the same phenomena, but one is an implied metric, how much profit or loss are they in, and how much did they actually take? Now, what we've done here is just applied very, very simple 155 day plus or minus, mean plus or minus one standard deviation. So just some very, very simple statistics. Obviously these can be calibrated to look at when you actually get some kind of extreme that's meaningful um, for any strategies that you're working through. But really we just got a very simple one standard deviation. Now we can see that on both of these local highs, when all of the short-term holders were in profit, we can see that their profits were actually meaningful. Right, the amount of profit they were in is now statistically meaningful. And these typically occur around these market peaks. Likewise, when we get some kind of major drawdown, lots of short-term holders suddenly fall into a loss. They fall into a loss. Is it statistically meaningful? Well, in this instance, it actually was. And on both of these dips, we actually did at the very least get some kind of a bounce or the price was arrested. And we get some kind of a regime shift on the more small scale time frame. Now, if you follow this channel, you know that we love to look for confluence. So since MVRV is an unrealized profit and loss, they may or they may not action it. And generally speaking, when you get confluence where you they're actually realizing those profits, it's one thing to be in profit. It's another thing to actually create the sell side that would put that top in. So you're actually looking for when both of these things are firing off, again, from whatever kind of statistical or, or um, uh, banding model that you wanted to use, but really looking for these events where both the implied profit and loss and the actualized profit and loss line up. Um, we've got a, a couple of our signals dashboards as well that focus on this particular property. You want to look at both the unrealized and the realized together. Then you've got your implied, your actualized, and a really cohesive message between the two. And this brings us along to our confidence in trend indicator. And this is just a really interesting tool. Um, where it's one of these ones that we've kind of developed over recent months. But uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to convert. So in the in the in the blue line here, we've got the MVRV. That is the short-term holder cost basis. So what MVRV is measuring is how far the black line price is away from their unrealized cost basis. In the orange is the spent cost basis. Of all the coins that short-term holders are moving, what is the delta between price and the orange bar? What is their cost basis? And what you can see is that at market tops, the spenders are have a much, much higher cost base. So they are locking in profits higher than the average cohort. During some kind of a down leg, the spending panics. The people who bought their coins on the way down keep panicking and they keep flushing out and people keep pushing their coins further and further down. The cost basis declines and we get a widening out between these two. Likewise at tops, we get this divergence to the upside. So this confidence in trend indicator gives us a couple of things. It's the magnitude of how much profit is being taken relative to their cost basis. So the magnitude of these levels is typically quite consistent when we're getting these local highs, but so too is the trend. Notice how at the all time high here, this is when Coinbase went live with their direct listing. We had already started to see a declining confidence. The spending cost basis was declining relative to the unspent cost basis. And this is really telling us that the market was losing some of that conviction. More and more people were starting to panic. There was more sell side pressure, more profit taking. We can see it again here during our May sell off. We started to see this weakening 
as we pushed into the $31,000 peak and it started to weaken from that point onwards. Now, where we are at the moment is we've actually moved into negative territory where people who are spending have a lower cost basis than the average of their unspent supply. So we are in a bit of a regime which signifies that their confidence has been shaken to a degree. Um, it shows that there is a little bit of loss taking is starting to dominate. This is something we touched on in recent weeks. And in many ways, it's, it's just showing you that there is a investor shift in the way that they're thinking about it. And particularly in that short term holder cohort, long term holders are more or less doing nothing. Um, so in many ways, it's kind of the short term holders who are that, that hot ball of money that is still trying to process and pass what has been going on over the last six months, which is kind of sideways, choppy, boring, non volatile, but 2019-esque style price action. So thanks for tuning in for that session, folks. Hopefully you found that useful. What we're really trying to do here is zoom in on a little bit more on the micro, looking at things at what's going on in the local tops and bottoms, looking for periods where both the unspent supply is in profit or loss and the actual spending is in profit or loss. Uh, we like to use these statistical deviations. Quite often, they're just really, really simple models to just help frame up when do we have something that is statistically meaningful over the recent time frame. So there's, uh, there's a number of ways we can slice and dice this, but uh, certainly the confidence in trend indicator is a really interesting way to just look at that short-term hold, that hot ball of money, and track the spending versus the not spending because the not spending is kind of the potential energy. They're the coins that are likely to spend at some point in the future and the spending of those who are at the front face the ones who are actually taking action and what you're looking for is changing behavior divergences or convergences between those two different cohorts so hopefully you found that useful let me know if you have any questions in the comments and i will see you in the next one cheers